like to welcome Russell Hearn, winemaker at Suru Vineyards, to our foodie tour. Russell has made extensive contributions to the New York wine industry over the past three decades, with his wines garnering extensive critical acclaim and industry-wide respect. His innovative winemaking style has influenced the quality of many wineries in our region, none more so than Pellegrini Vineyards and more recently, Leap Cellars and Bridge Lane. Australian-born, Russell grew up around wine as his mother was in the business. Russell started his career in Western Australia and has taken his training with him throughout his journey with experience gained working in New Zealand, France, and regions across the USA. Russell found producers like Suru Wines to flourish. He brings his knowledge, experience, and relationships with quality New York State growers. The vineyard was, how the vineyard was growing, how, how, how large were the shoots, how long did they grow? You, you would like maybe four feet, four and a half feet of shoot growth. You don't want eight feet of, of shoot growth because you're going to cut it off anyway. That's a waste. Um, you, you'd like to have shoots the size of, of your finger. You don't want shoots you know, larger than your, your thumb. Again, because of the, the fruitfulness. So there's, there's, there's a, there's a, we'll call it as a science. There definitely is a science involved with pruning. Once you get into the growing season, if you've done things right, obviously things are growing. Um, before the, um, before say the 1950s, there was, so now we see all these very manicured rows that are planted. Uh, before the 1950s, most vines around the world were head pruned vines. They were, they were standalone vines. They were in rope, they were in lines, but there was no posts or trellis. There was no connecting wire that, that attached them. So there was one particular plant six or 10 feet away. There was another plant growing by itself and, and so forth. In the 50s, because of the, the, the idea of to try to mechanize uh, vineyards, um, the, the trellis system was, was developed. Um, so we have all these posts and wires that the things are trained to, on. Uh, for mechanization. So obviously tractors can go down and, and mow and spray and do a number of different techniques. Uh, so the industry has moved in the last, say, 60, 70 years to being predominantly trellised. There are a few areas still in the world that, that are head pruned, but in general, 90, I, I would say 98, 99% of the world's industry has moved to a trellis. So the goal has that same sort of schematic, uh, here is the, the fruiting wire, and then up here, uh, so the post is six or seven feet tall. The fruiting wire is about three feet off the ground. We try to train everything along that, that, that fruiting wire, so as you have a concentration of, of the, where the clusters grow um, for, and then along that wire, and then above that wire, there are a number of different movable wires that you'll see people lifting and, and lowering throughout the growing season. The idea of, of um, pretty well all the vineyards out here is called a, it's, uh, it's called a VSP, a vertical shoot positioning trellis. And a grapevine wants to, a, gra a grapevine wants to fall over. So the shoots as they grow have a tendency to fall. That's why head pruned vines were, were, the, were the, the way to do something for you know, thousands of years, because that's the natural tendency of the grapevine. What we want to do um, is to have the shoots as vertical as possible and as narrow as possible. So as opposed to the letting them fall over, we have these movable catch wires that down the rows that you lift and hold the shoots as upright as possible. So uh, all the vineyards out here, if you, if you, if you looked down a row, the, the canopy may be a foot wide. Um, the goal, the reason is that um, the, the outer leaf is photosynthesizing at 100%. If you have another leaf inside that outer leaf, the shade is, is making it only photosynthesize at 10% because there's 90% in shade. If you have a third leaf, it's 90%, so it's now 1%. So what we need to do, and, and 
all regions in the world want to try to maximize the amount of photosynthesis, photosynthetic growth into ripening the fruit. So the, the, the narrower the canopy, the better it is. So everything is, 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 is pruned and then when, as it's growing, it is tucked into the canopy and then, and then probably uh, early, middle, Ju middle July, what we do is we then additionally along that fruiting wire where all the grapes are, um, we'll take off leaves along the fruiting zone to, to expose the grapes. And we're exposing the grapes for sunlight to help ripen the fruit, but also allow any sprays that we're putting on to have good penetration under the grapes. So some of the cultural practices that, that, are, that, that happen you know, in our area are more intensive than a warmer, warmer climate, but uh, the growing techniques are, are very similar around the world at this point in time. It's to try to maximize the amount of, of growth. We've only got so much sunlight, which creates so much photosynthesis, which ripens only so much grapes at this point in time. So you want to try to maximize that to eventually put that into to wine. Obviously harvest happens, uh, is starting to happen in another couple of weeks. Uh, sparkling is going to start uh, the second week of September. Uh, the, the main particular main part of harvest will start probably September 20th, 24th, 25th. And then most of the fruit will be picked anywhere from late September through the end of October. So oh. Once it's, once it's harvest, obviously there's two types of uh, harvesting techniques, uh, hand picking, uh, which is the most obvious, uh, and then machine harvesting. If some of you have seen some of these large machines that have been driving, that drive around uh, the, the North Fork at this time of the year, um, the mechanical harvest, harvesters, again, because of the, the rows and the trellis, um, um, mechanical harvesters straddle the vine, so they would go, they would go over the vine itself, and drive down the row, shaking, shaking the vine relatively gently to try to knock the ripe berries off, picking them up before they would fall into the, into, uh, onto, the, onto the floor and put them into, a, into a, a gondola or a trailer and take it to the winery. Hand harvesting, a very, very good uh, you know, experienced person might pick a ton and a half, maybe, maybe two tons a day. Um, uh, everyone sitting around listening to me, including me, uh, we would pick maybe a third of a ton per day uh, at, at, if we do really, really well. Um, a mechanical harvester uh, can pick a, an acre of grapes uh, in about 40 minutes. So, so the machine is picking at uh, about six tons an hour. Um, so, so there's choices between why you would use mechanical harvesting as well as, uh, or why you would hand harvest. A lot of white wine, um, is, it, it goes back and forth. Um, it's maybe the time, the type of year, the growing season, the disease pressure, uh, why you would choose mechanical versus hand. Most red wine is hand harvested uh, because of the selection in the vineyard. Uh, the machine doesn't make any decision in regards to what it picks, it picks everything. Uh, where hopefully a, a good a good uh, picker pr um, might pick only the best fruit and leave some of the not as developed fruit on the vine uh, from a from a quality standpoint. So uh, you, you you always want the best fruit in in whites as well as reds, but it's very very important when it comes to red wine. Um, so now once it's got into the cellar, uh, so here's here's the winemaker talking, and all I've talked about so far has been the uh, the, the vineyard, um, but I go back to my first point is that the better the fruit, the easier my job is. Uh, so the, the idea is to, to deliver the highest quality fruit to the wine, uh, to the winery. Then it's, then it becomes now, then I'm in charge uh, until it's picked mother nature's in charge. Uh, and she still is in charge for the next you know, two to four weeks, five weeks. Um, I, I pay a lot of attention to the weather throughout the growing season. Um, but I, I can tell you, in the next 60 days, uh, I'll know I'll be looking at the weather two or three times a day. Uh, uh, it's very, very important as to how you know your decision when to pick and, and why to pick, as 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 re in regards to um, uh, obviously the incoming weather. Once it's in once it's in the winery, 
then then it's very easy. Uh, then it's up to a you have a, a myriad of, of of choices in regards to what what the goal of your wine is is all about. Um, so uh, you have to obviously start with where where you want to be. Um, and so from a uh, from a white wine, when it comes to Suru, for instance, um, we make Pinot Grigio. Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, they're, our, uh, they're our white varieties. Obviously, we make a rosé. Um, stylistically, if I'm shooting for a certain style of, of wine, a certain type of wine that, I'm, that hopefully I can repeat you know, each year. There's always going to be variations of vintage. But for instance, when it comes to uh, either of those, and, and we obviously make a Riesling as well, um, but um, any of those varieties, the, the, the the level of acidity, the crispness, the freshness of the wine is very, very important. So in a, in a warm year, I would whole cluster press, I would hand harvest and put the, the whole grapes into the press and press them off that way because it retains more fruitiness, but it also retains a, a higher level of, of, of acidity that's in the grapes itself. In a cool year, the grapes are going to have naturally occurring more acid so we might machine harvest or destem and crush more to try to get get more richness and i'll say minimize the amount of acid so you can manipulate the same amount same same fruit by how you press then then obviously once it's into the cellar um these uh, the, there's a myriad of yeasts that have been selected over the years uh, that people use uh, all of them I mean, you talk some of the people talk a little bit about indigenous yeasts wild yeast versus you know um, propagated you know, uh, yeast all yeast were indigenous at some stage uh, what's happened over the again the last 50 60 years is in regions around the world in in, in champagne or in burgundy or or in uh, tuscany there's certain strains that that live very well and produce maybe the better quality uh, that have been isolated and then grown again in the lab and freeze dried and, and grown. So you can buy a, a Barolo yeast that, that, that uh, was a, a, the dominant or is the dominant variety yeast um, strain in the Barolo area of, of, of Italy. So from a winemaking standpoint, you, you can pick and choose between what you're trying to do, what you're looking for. Do you want a lot more fruit? Do you want more mouthfeel? Um, and, and so it starts with the pressing. It, it definitely uh, is, is aided by which yeast strain that you, that you use. It's definitely affected by the temperature that you're, you're fermenting at. Uh, so in the case of, uh, again, you know, white wine production, if you were fermenting at 78 degrees, you would lose all the fruitiness of the wine. Um, it would taste flabby and, and, and bland. Uh, if you're fermenting at 68 or 65 or 62, you're, you're, you're extracting more flavor profiles from the actual grape or retaining more flavor profiles from the grape. So um, post-fermentation, fermentation obviously is, is uh, yeast converting sugar into alcohol um, with hopefully as low amount of byproducts as possible. That's the other reason that, you know, that of a yeast selection, certain yeasts, you can't put Fleischmann's uh, bread yeast into, into wine. Uh, it'll ferment for the first three or four, uh, 5% alcohol, and then it's dead. Uh, so uh, wine yeasts are, are specific to wine itself. Uh, even beer yeast would not work in wine because of the alcohol level. Once you get above five or six or 7% alcohol, they would also die off. So, um, but the, the, uh, the, so the, the, the yeast that I would select for, say, Pinot Grigio would be very different to uh, Riesling, uh, which would be very different to any of the red wines that we would produce. Um, once you get past fermentation, uh, depending on the wine style, obviously, you know, barrel fermented, you know, Chardonnays would go into a barrel. All of our white wines uh, are tank fermented, trying to, try to make them as fresh and, and clean, as crisp as possible. I think in, in, in any region, you know, many people have sort of said over the, in the wine industry around the world, things that grow together, go together. Uh, and I think in our area, uh, seafood um, is, is, is very dominant. Uh, so light and fresh and crisp white wines uh, work beautifully with seafood. So hence the movement towards in the, in the, in the 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of Chardonnay and a lot of barrel fermented Chardonnay being made out here. Uh, there's less and less of that being made and there's more. Uh, 
uh, tank fermented Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, uh, light Albarino. There's, there's more lighter uh, styled white wines being made because of the cuisine. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, red wine, obviously uh, it's, a, it's sort of a, a totally different animal. Um, with whites, what you what you originally do is you're you're one way or another you'll separate the stems and the seeds and the skins from the juice. Juice goes inside, settles into the fermentation. With red wine, you're eliminating, you're destemming, so you're taking off the, the, the cluster itself, the, st the stem, the rachis, getting rid of that, breaking the berries and putting them into, into the tank. So red wine is fermented in contact with the skins and the seeds for anywhere from two to maybe five weeks. Uh, and, then, and then at the end, then it will go back to the press and you'll press off the wine at that point in time, separating the, the skins and the seeds. In the skins and the seeds of, of red wine is the color and the tannin. Um, so you can make a white wine from a red grape by pressing it immediately, but you obviously can't make a red wine from a white grape. Uh, so uh, uh, Liebe uh, makes a white Merlot. They also make a a red Merlot uh, or a Merlot, you know, is a red wine Merlot. The reason, the, the way Lee produces a white Merlot is by picking it about two weeks earlier than you typically would pick it for a red grape and then whole cluster pressing it, putting it directly into the press, pressing it very, very lightly. The juice is white. The skin has the pigment and the, and the tannin. So hence you're not picking up the color uh, from the skin. With a red wine, you would leave it ripen, you know, two or three weeks longer, then harvest it, crush it, put the skin, seeds, and juice into a tank and ferment it, and hence, obviously, make a red wine from it. Uh, so there's 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 a, there's a bundle of uh, techniques in the cellar that are driven by the goal of where you want to end up. Do you are you making a lighter style? Are you make are you trying to make a fuller bodied, you know, style? Uh, what what's the variety? How how do you interpret the variety? What do you enjoy drinking? Um, so again, with the uh, Suru or, or leaf sellers, or when I was involved with Pellegrini over the years, um, the quality of the fruit obviously drives the quality, but the but the style is driven by the by the winemaker or the the winery as to what they're trying to end up with. Um, so uh, to give a, a an example. Um, Lens makes very, very good wines. Lens wines are quite different to what Pellegrini wines were a number of years ago. Just the winemaker's interpretation of where he wanted to get to versus where I wanted to get to were quite different. Uh, we both respected the quality, but but they were they were different. They were different bottles of of, of Merlot. So the, the person who enjoyed the Lens Merlot you know, may not be necessarily have been the Pellegrini uh, uh, consumer and vice versa. Um, our area in general um, uh, overlaps and, and is not dramatically different um, because of our, our climate, but, in, but there are some stylistic changes uh, that, that vary. So lastly, what I'd just like to finish on before we maybe have some questions um, uh, is when I first started in the industry in the 70s, uh, back in Australia, um, there were sort of two types of wines in the world, in my opinion, there was old world and new world. Uh, obviously old world being Europe and, um, and new world being, you know, Australia and New Zealand and America uh, and, uh, you know, um, even to a certain extent, Chile and, and different parts of South Africa. Um, now, because of the exchange of information over the last 60, 70 years, uh, viticulturally and in the winery, um, you've, got a, you've got an Australian on Long Island, you've got a, a German, uh, over at Wolfer, uh, you have uh, two French winemakers uh, here. You've got uh, two Italians. Uh, so there's a, a, an exchange of people. There's an exchange of information around the world. Um, now what we have is warm climate wines and cool climate wines. Um, cool regions in Italy are making wines similar to what I'm making here and vice versa. Uh, warm climate uh, Regions in Australia are making same same as warm climate wines in Europe, so the the, the choice has become: do you do you enjoy warm climate wines or cool climate wines, or maybe even when do you enjoy both of them? And to me, I think the biggest difference um, is is the acidity, is the crispness, 
is the, the delicacy uh, is much more pr prominent in cool climate wines than warm climate wines. So to me, uh, I, I, I drink cool climate wines with the meal because they go with the food. I might have a glass or you know or two of a warm climate wine before the meal, um, or maybe a warm climate wine with a big red you know steak or or something else. So there's those pairings that that are always you know, critical when it comes to wine, and I think the it's very important to uh, sort of understand why you enjoy certain wines over other wines, and maybe that allows you to sort of expand uh, your selection as to and improve your selection as to what it is. You don't have to pick producers. You have to try to pick types of what you, what, what. So whenever you're going into a wine shop, if you're, if you're asking for suggestions, tell that the, the wine buyer, hey, I like this or I like that. And they'll have a much better chance of, of referring you to something that might be similar or something that, that you might enjoy versus, um, you know, the, there's just way too many wines being made out there to, you know, take a pot chance of, of, of taking it off the shelf. So. Anyway, so I've spoken for long enough at this point in time. Hopefully I've done it in a somewhat linear kind of approach, but uh, if there are some questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer any of them. Uh, Russ, uh, this is Bob Deek. Uh, that was very interesting, but how do you price wine? I've been in restaurants and I've seen a bottle of red wine for $18,000 mm -hmm. from <laughs> Italy. Um, Which we didn't buy. And, uh, so, um, there are a lot of good wines less than that for sure, but sure. How, do you, how do you get from doing this and making a living at it and then how do you get $1,000 a bottle of wine like Screaming Eagle? Sure, sure. Um, Robert Mondavi uh, years ago said a bottle of wine should be a one hundredth the price of the ton of grapes. So, and, it, and that's a pretty good uh, analogy. So if, you've, if you're growing grapes that you could sell for $2,000 a ton, you should be able to get $20 a bottle for that wine. Mm -hmm. um, so in our area, we, our region is in that, in that price range. We, we grow grapes anywhere from say $1,800 to maybe $2,500 per ton. Um, in, in, in certain areas, Napa Valley, um, when where they're trying to really push the window of of ripeness and exposure and a number of different things, um, those grapes might sell for ten thousand dollars per ton. Uh, so hence a hundred dollars. Um, I think realistically, up to about fifty or sixty dollars a bottle, which still seems high for most people. Up to fifty or sixty dollars a bottle. The inputs: how much it costs you to grow it, uh, how much it costs you to make it the barrels, you know, all, all the inputs are relatively, you know, linear. Uh, they, 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 once it gets above $50, you are bought, it's like, like, like it's like buying, um, you know, um, anything. It's like, like buying uh, perfume or, or clothes. Uh, once it gets above $50 a bottle, you are buying the label. Um, not to say that the wine is not good, mm -hmm. but there is, there is nothing that drives the price up from a reality uh, when it comes to $50 and up. So the, the $50 bottle versus the $95 bottle probably costs you exactly the same thing to make. But the $95 has a better reputation and has been critically acclaimed better and has maybe a longer history. Uh, so hence they can ask that price. Mm -hmm. Then the case of restaurants, um, what we sell it to a, a store and a, and a restaurant, a store typ typically puts 50% markup on where a restaurant might put 100 to 150% markup on because of the service and the glass and everything all involved. So a $10 bottle that we might sell to a store would be $15, where the $10 could be a 20 or $25 bottle in a restaurant. Thank you. Russ, I'm, I'm interested to hear a little bit about um, Premium Wine Group, if you could. I remember when you opened it up, and I remember how it did allow uh, area vineyards to be able to come and produce their, their wines with you, and then 
and then have the this is a resource. How did you get involved in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you sort of skipped past that completely. Um, so so uh, start, we moved here in 1990. I, I got involved with Pellegrini uh, at the beginning when it was a vineyard, when they were looking to build their winery. So uh, I got involved. I was lucky enough to work with the architects and pick out all the equipment. And I was sort of, I guess you could say, employee number one with Pellegrini. And I was, I was in, uh, at Pellegrini from 91 through 2000 full time and then stayed on or switched to being a, a, a consultant till 2012. Um, but during the 91 to 2000 period, um, in 93, 94, 95, uh, we had very good growing years in a row. We had three really warm, dry years. Uh, and Long Island um, uh, had made numerous changes before then in the industry, but that was really the first two or three vintages that um, put Long Island uh, on the map. Um, uh, New York Times said, hey, Long Island's arrived. You know, Wine Spectator said, oh, they're making you know, really good wines out there. So that was the beginning of at the sort of the continuing success of our region. Um, so from those vintages with, that were coming out in 96 and 97 and 98, you know, um, there was a lot of attention that came onto our area and quite a few people. So in, in 1995, there were 800 acres planted. Uh, by 2001, there was there was uh, there were 1,600 acres planted. So we doubled in six years, and then we've gone to 3,000 since then. So there was this bubble coming of of all these producers, all these grape growers, either looking to sell their fruit to area wineries or start making wine themselves. Um, and it's a um, it's a very uh, labor. So the vineyard takes three years to get your first crop. Uh, and then depending on white wine, you may maybe another year before you start selling it. So that's four years uh, with a red wine. Maybe it's two more years. So that's six years um, as well as all the equipment uh, involved. So I, I saw this bubble coming um, and I, um, so I put together a business plan to offer smaller producers the ability to share a facility so premium wine group owns the the land the buildings the equipment uh we employ today um uh 14 14 full-time people uh in 2000 we employed uh, four full-time people um but the individual producers so suru for instance so suru is separately owned than premium wine group obviously even though i'm involved with both so suru is a customer of of of, of uh, premium leap sellers is a customer of a premium wine group so um rgny formerly martha clara produces their wines at premium wine group so it's their grapes it's their winemaking direction um they have a consulting winemaker uh, it's their yeast selection it's their barrels uh ultimately they buy the bottles corks capsules screw caps but it's our services to take grapes into wine under their direction. Um, so it's an affordable way of producing a smaller quantity of wine because you're sharing equipment and personnel that would be, wouldn't be used as, as, as well throughout the year. So um, we have uh, 16 producers at Premium Wine Group currently. Um, so if Premium Wine Group hadn't been built, and all 16 were in the industry today, they, each winery would have a press. We have three between 16. Everyone would have a crusher. We have two between 16. Uh, we, you know, each winery would have a refrigeration system and tanks and a bottling line uh, that would be sitting around. You know, so, our bot so at Pellegrini Vineyards making about 10,000 cases, their bottling line runs, uh, about 18 days a year. So the rest of the year, it's doing nothing. Uh, so you have a huge investment that, you, that you're not using. So premium has allowed uh, uh, a number of smaller producers to make wines more affordably and put their focus in on growing it better and hopefully selling it better. Um, hey. And luckily, uh, our first harvest was, um, we, we collectively, brought in 450 tons. Uh, this year, collectively, we'll bring in close to 1,900 tons. So we've grown 
pretty That's steadily great. throughout the year. Well, you were, you were truly visionary because you saw, like as you said, you actually saw it as a bubble and that this need was going to be there. And, you know, you say it and, you know, one could take for granted that they would have the press, they would have the equipment they needed, but that equipment was very expensive. And I remember I was um, very much involved with the implementation establishment of harps and they could not afford that equipment. And if it wasn't for Premium Wine Group, I don't think Ed ever would have planted those original vines because first of all, he didn't want to become uh, a, a winemaker, but he, he could see that his children were more interested in grapes and making wine than they were in growing pumpkins and corn. So he took the chance and he did that. And thanks to Premium Wine Group, they were able to, to do that. No, it's, um, I guess in 2000, there were, I think in 2000, there was, um, I think 24 or 25 wineries. So now there's, so now there's 55. Um, mm -hmm. So we have 16 of those 30 new producers. Mm -hmm. um, in a, in a, if you'd asked me 21 years ago, how many, how many wineries would start producing wine at premium and then get to a certain level and then build their own? I would have said, oh, five or six or seven by now. Um, so Sparkling Point uh, produced their first seven vintages at, at Premium Wine Group. They got confident enough in, in their business that they could you know, sell the amount of wine that they were hoping to sell, so hence they built their own winery, they left. We continue to do some services for Sparkling Point. Um, McCall Vineyard started producing wine at, at Premium Wine Group. So there's been, there's, there's, uh, uh, Matabella started producing wine at, at Premium. So there's been three. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm surprised, impressed, uh, proud that only three have gone on versus staying at, at Premium Wine Group. Mm -hmm. But that's a natural, that's a natural progression uh, uh, in, in the industry anyway. Uh, but I think at this point in time, we have a pretty stable group. Um, apart from it being an affordable way of producing a small, smaller quantity, you're also afforded the, a lot more equipment that you could ever possibly justify buying uh, being a small producer. So uh, I think that's been also one of the pulls uh, to, to hold people to produ continue producing wine at Premium Wine Group. That's all we do. We, are, we, don't, we don't make one bottle of wine ourselves under premium wine groups license. So if we don't do custom production, well, we're out of business. Well, good job. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Russ, in the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned that you went into the business because your mother was in the business. Could you tell us what her involvement was? in Sure. The wine? She, um, so I grew up in Western Australia, uh, just outside of Perth. Um, she worked for the second largest winery in, in Western Australia, um, uh, Sandalford Wines. Uh, she was in, involved, she was in marketing. Um, so she was in wholesale, wholesale as well as retail marketing for uh, Sandalford. And then a little bit later, she moved to another winery. Uh, so as a kid, I, you know, summer job, you know, was working at the end of the bottling line or making cases mm -hmm. or doing things like that. So I was around wineries growing up. Um, I, I had initially thought of going into architecture, um, but the closer I got to sort of making that decision, you know, uh, uh, in my, as I was getting, you know, out of school or, or, or towards the, my end of my secondary, you know, education at least, um, I, I really enjoyed the wine business and so uh, decided to go into the wine, you know, wine industry instead. And I'm, and I'm, I'm really glad that I did. Uh, it's, it's been... Uh, um, I'm sure it might have been, it would have enjoyed architecture as well, but uh, uh, it's been it's been a, it's been a great journey. Uh, so so I was involved from the beginning because of her. Thank you very much. I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned several wineries for which you are the winemaker. This is at the same time. You're you're the winemaker for Suru and another winemaker. Yeah, I, I, I am the winemaker for Lee Bridge Lane. How so. does that work? I mean, it it it, I, I, it almost seems like a conflict of interest, 
or is it just because the grapes themselves are so different from one place to another? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Suru, Suru does not make any variety that Lieb does. Okay. Uh, so that is the first sort of separation. Um, um, I think I think stylistically, you know, there's there's a lot of similarities in the varieties, you know, but there's not there's not a, con a direct conflict when it comes to uh, individual grape varieties itself. So um, to give you the c connection of of why maybe um, excuse me uh, back to two, back to 1992, Pellegrini I was involved with Pellegrini. We Pellegrini grew most of their varieties, uh, most of their grapes, but also purchased uh, from a few area uh, uh, vineyards, one of which was Lieb Vineyards. Uh, Mark, Mark and Kathy Lieb were originally grape growers and then eventually in 1999 started custom producing wine at another place, uh, another winery, McCary Vineyards, and then uh, was involved with um, a premium wine group from the beginning. Uh, so we, so I met, knew them for for many, many years prior to that. Um, and then to Lieb was then a custom. So, so when I started Premium Wine Group, uh, I couldn't do it by myself, uh, I, uh, even though I was the managing partner. So I, I attracted two financial investors, uh, partners, uh, Bernie Sussman, who looked at it as a pure uh, uh, good business investment. And then Mark Lieb saw it as a way of not needing to build his own winery, but become a customer of his own facility. So Mark and I have known each other for 25, 26 years at this point in time. And then about six years ago, um, Mark's goal was to hopefully have his children um, enter the business and, and take over the business, you know, going forward. They really didn't have that much desire uh, for the, for the grape, for the wine industry. Uh, so he realized that he probably needed to sell it. Um, so, about six years ago, Lieb Sellers and Premium Wine Group actually merged uh, and, they're, and they're jointly owned at this point in time. So then I became the winemaker uh, for Lieb going mm. forward. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. There's a few wineries out here that the winemaker is, um, is the same. So Sparkling Points winemaker is Gilles Martin, uh, one of the French winemakers that I spoke about. Uh, he also makes wine for McCall Vineyards, uh, totally different wines. Uh, obviously, Sparkling Point is, is all sparkling. McCall is not sparkling. It's uh, it's rosé, Sauvignon Blanc, and, and, and Pinot Noir and red wine. So we do have a little crossover of a few other winemakers. It's not necessarily uncommon. There's someone else. Very good. Looks like I must have covered it pretty well then. You did. You did. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. If you Hi. haven't had an opportunity to visit Suru's Tasting Room on Main Road in Kutchog, please do. It's a beautiful location. They renovated the uh, building so beautifully. It's, it's comfortable. It's warm. It's a really nice place to visit with terrific wines. And if you haven't um, logged on to the North Fork Foodie Tour website. Please do, because we are offering a $100 uh, <laughs> VIP tickets where you will have a, a private uh, conversation with, who, who's the, is it, is it with Russ? The conversation? Probably. Either, either Shelby or, or Susan, but uh, either my daughter Shelby or Susan. Okay, and, and you will get a fifty dollar mm -hmm. gift certificate for Suru Wines for that. So we thank you for for joining us for our Shabbat and shoes and for everything that you're doing with our foodie tour and everything that you're doing for the North Fork. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for us. I'm a big fan of the blends on the North Fork. I think they far uh, they're far superior than the individual grapes. Um, that's one thing. I'm wondering, uh, number one, uh, when it comes to whites, <clears throat> are there white blends as well? Did you ever think about that Friulano grape from Northern Italy? Because everybody talks about uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and Riesling, but nobody talks about Friulano. There's one vineyard 
on the North for on, on Long Island that I know that sells it, it's uh, Channing Daughters, but it's a great grape and I'm wondering why it's never been um, caught on to, so to speak, here on Long Island. And I don't know that I can hear your answer. I'm gonna try to push the right button, but did you hear my question? I did. Hopefully you can see an unmute, an unmute button there. But um, so firstly, uh, blends, red blends, I, I fully, I 100% agree. Um, I think that um, there's, there's very few red uh, and what, well, there's very few red uh, wines that are best being made as a single varietal. Uh, right. Pinot, Pinot Noir is absolutely best by itself. Um, uh, maybe Sangiovese. Um, there's a couple of other ones, but in general, blending is is the is always the best way. You can you can you can make a much more complete wine. Right. By choosing the the the, the, the components from each particular variety. So in our case. Our, 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 our reds are Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, maybe a little bit of Petit Verdot, sometimes Malbec. Um, each of them have, each of them have d varying components. Cabernet Sauvignon has much more tannin, much more finish on the finish. Merlot is much fuller in the mid palate. Cabernet Franc is much uh, more aromatic and, and, and upfront. So by right. putting those things together, you can fill out a wine much better. Right. Uh, right. So for sure, red wine uh, is is in general always better as a as a blend. Why, unfortunately, blends are not uh, accepted as much in America. Uh, back in the '60s, when when Mondavi Winery um, uh, he did a lot for the industry, uh, but this is the one thing in my, my opinion he did a negative for. But in the in the '60s, when Mondavi was starting, he said. Because uh, at that point in time, there, there were no varietals, there were no Chardonnays and Cabernet Sauvignons or Merlots right. being you know, made in the world. It was all blends. Uh, and, and Mondavi said, I'm going to separate myself from, from the rest of the world, from Europe. I'm going to make 100% Chardonnay, 100% Sauvignon Blanc, 100% Cabernet. I'm going to put the name on the label. That's going to be what I'm going to market myself to separate myself. And he did, and he was very successful at that, and he made very, very good wines. But America as a, as, a, as a wine nation was not a very large consuming wine nation at that point in time. So we've taken a long time to try to get out of that bad habit. Um, when it comes to white wines, um, in general, most whites stand on themselves, by themselves. You know, right, uh, right. Riesling, you know, benefits from a little bit of Gewürztraminer, Sauvignon Blanc maybe benefits from a little bit of Semillon. But right. in general, you don't sort of blend whites. Uh, they don't work as well. Um, okay. Frulliano to the, to the last point. Um, you know, I think, I think it's newness of our industry. Uh, we, we're, we're starting to experiment with some other varieties. Uh, that, that, that varieties, my understanding of it is that it's more winter susceptible than a lot of other ones. Uh, but, but Channing Daughter has not had those issues so far. Um, I think it's I think it's just time. Uh, other varieties are starting to come in. Sauvignon Blanc has obviously come in in a much larger way. Albarino is planted by a couple of people. There's a right, few right. people experimenting. So you have success from Channing Daughter. People will pay attention. You know, Lieb, Lieb has Pinot Blanc planted. Um, people are starting to pay attention to that. So now there's three or four producers of Pinot Blanc. So uh, right. I think in 10 years or 15, nothing happens. The only thing that happens very quickly in the wine industry is you can spend a lot of money. Um, everything else takes a long time. So I think it's just time. One last question. Are you going to be around tomorrow coming out? Yes, I am. Okay. You'll be, you'll be at your, uh, yeah, so we're, open, your... Uh, we're open 12 to uh, 12 to six. Okay. Ooh. Totally cool. I look forward to meeting you. My name is Bert. Right. Yeah, Bert. Glad you could, glad you could hear me at the end. Yeah, I did. I pushed the wrong button. That's what it was. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Russell.